Thank you for the introduction and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are participating from. I am Martin Ehlert from Apotex, and I wish to thank the FDA organizers of this year's GDSR Initiatives Public Workshop, especially for the opportunity to participate at this session on the ongoing and challenging issue of nitrosamines. I will share with you three areas of investigation that are worthy of sponsorship and could fruitfully inform policy on nitrosamines control. First, complex nitrosamines are almost all data poor species when it comes to carcinogenicity studies. Without such studies on these substances, ANDA holders are left with little in the way of tools to establish acceptable intakes and have to rely on the read across approach research into alternative approaches to AI determination for data-poor nitrosamines is needed. Second, I would guess most of the people attending this panel discussion today are aware of the causal connection between nitrosating species in excipients and precursor amines in APIs, resulting in nitrosamines formation in drug products. However, the extent and kinetics of reaction between these two in a given drug product is not yet predictable. This is another area where research could assist with establishing control strategies. Third, tertiary amine APIs are more numerous than secondary amine APIs, which we are well aware of being susceptible to nitrosation. Though direct nitrosation of tertiary amines is known in the chemical literature, the reaction conditions are quite forcing for this to occur. Research into the extent of nitrosation of tertiary amine APIs under typical drug product manufacturing processes is warranted. We are now well acquainted with what we term the simple nitrosamines, and I have four examples shown here on the left. These simple nitrosamines have acceptable intake values provided in the FDA guidance on nitrosamines in pharmaceutical products. On the other hand, the finding of complex nitrosamines related to APIs dubbed NDSRIs, or nitrosamine drug substance related impurities, has greatly increased since July 2021, when the US public was first made aware of nitrosovarenicline. This and the other three examples shown here have all been the source of recalls since then. Almost all of these complex nitrosamines do not have published acceptable intakes, mainly because until now the species had not been identified and so none had been subjected to animal carcinogenicity studies. This brings us to the first area that urgently needs further research and policy development, namely establishing a non-ad hoc process for acceptable intakes for complex nitrosamines. Drug product nitrosamine control strategies necessarily must be informed by quantitative acceptable intake limits. The italicized text here is quoted from the control of nitrosamines impurities in human drugs, FDA guidance. If nitrosamines without published AI limits are found in drug products, manufacturers should use the approach outlined in ICHM 7 to determine the risk associated with nitrosamine and contact the agency about the acceptability of any proposed limit. This is an eminently reasonable requirement of the guidance. However, it is very challenging to implement. Unlike the simple nitrosamines which have published limits, almost no complex nitrosamines have been subjected to animal carcinogenicity studies, and certainly none for all the newly discovered nitrosamines in drug products in the last couple of years, like the examples I provided on the previous slide. So this leaves ANDA holders with only toxicological read across to arrive at AIs for complex nitrosamines they encounter in their drug products. Based on public domain information, what does the current picture look like with read across vis-a-vis -vis empirical data? The graph on this slide gives that picture. The y-axis is the TD50 value or 50% lifetime risk tumorigenic dose for the nitrosamines plotted. The lower the value, the more potent the substance is, and TD values are directly proportional to acceptable intakes. So you can view the TD values as being equivalent to acceptable intakes. Please note that it is a logarithmic scale spanning five orders of magnitude, 
so things at the top of the plot are about 100,000 times less potent than things at the bottom. The x-axis is the molecular mass of the nitrosamines plotted. The blue circles are the TD50 values for all the alkyl and aryl N nitrosamines listed in the Lhasa carcinogenicity database. About 86 of them that have been subjected to animal carcinogenicity studies between the late 1960s up to the 1990s. Only three of these nitrosamines are related to APIs. The rest are non-API chemicals with NDMA and NDEA labeled for context. Nitrosamines appearing at the top of the y-axis were deemed non-carcinogenic by the study authors. There is a relationship between increasing TD50 versus the molecular mass of the nitrosamines. Of course, competing molecular steric and electronic differences between the different nitrosamines will cause variation in potency, and this makes the plot look a bit messy. To make the trend easier to visualize, the black squares represent the harmonic mean of all the experimentally measured nitrosamines grouped into bins 50 atomic mass units wide. Please note the harmonic mean is a very conservative mean that heavily weights the lowest values, which are the most potent ones. The black squares do show that higher molecular mass nitrosamines tend towards high TD50 values. In other words, lower potency. The thick blue arrow is the typical molecular mass range for nitrosamines derived from small molecule APIs. Importantly, the reddish-orange diamonds plotted here are all the publicly available read-across established TD50s for nitrosamines since 2018. Again, I will remind you that read-across TD50 values are not experimentally measured. They are hypotheses. If one considers especially those examples that appear at the higher molecular masses, they do not reflect the empirical data for TD50s when considered en masse. Further research into establishing alternatives to standard read-across is urgently needed for complex nitrosamines. This slide was presented at the November 2021 AAM GRX and Biosims Technical Conference and I'm reprising it here to introduce a case study about nitrosamines control strategies. The main point from this slide is that levels of NDMA that have been found in metformin drug products were dramatically lower than the stoichiometrically possible NDMA levels based on the amount of precursor dimethylamine or DMA that was present in the metformin API. In fact, potentially 1,000 times higher levels of NDMA were possible than were actually observed. The first explanation that might jump to mind here is that there was not enough nitrosating agent present in the drug product to convert all of the DMA present in the API to NDMA. Let's hold that thought and I'll come back to it shortly. Just this month, Schlingemann and co-workers from Merck published a highly detailed root cause investigation into the formation of NDMA in their immediate release and extended release metformin drug products, glucophage and glucophage XR. They investigated DMA and NDMA formation and purge in their API process, nitrite and NDMA levels in their excipients, and NDMA formation in their drug product processes and packaging. It is a very informative paper and I encourage you to read it if you have the opportunity. The main conclusions of the paper are, first, metformin API is not a significant source of NDMA, but a threshold level of DMA in API is necessary for an adequate NDMA control strategy in the drug product. Second, nitrite levels in excipients are supplier dependent and the dominating factor for NDMA generation in, in these drug products. Thirdly, nitrocellulose inks in litting foils can lead to elevated NDMA at higher temperature and humidity. Notwithstanding the excellent investigation of Schlingemann et al., when the amine precursor is an impurity in the API and nitrosating species precursors are present in the drug product, the question remains for drug product control strategies. Where are they? 
In other words, what are the microspatial distributions of these precursors in the respective raw materials, and do they have microscale mobility over the shelf life of the drug product? That question remains as relevant now as it was last November. And to illustrate that point, this is another plot from the Schlingemann paper. These box plots show the theoretical amount of NDMA that could form in their XR and IR products, respectively, based on the levels of nitrite they measure in the key excipient they use from different excipient suppliers. I have superimposed onto these plots the maximum amount of NDMA that they measured in the two products. Especially in the case of the XR formulation, the levels of NDMA actually present in the drug product never come close to the amount that could be theoretically generated, even when the supplier excipient with the highest level of nitrite is used in the formulation. This paper shows that in the case of these metformin products, the amount of NDMA generated in the drug product is consuming only a very small fraction of available DMA and nitrite precursors present. So although measuring and controlling the average content of these precursors in input raw materials will be a component of nitrosamine's control strategies, understanding what limits their reaction to form the nitrosamines in drug products is an important area warranting GDSR funding. There is a vexing question about complex nitrosamine precursors. Here is the real example. In March 2022, a manufacturer of the muscle pain reliever ophenadrine citrate recalled their product due to unacceptable levels of the complex nitrosamine endosmethyl and nitrosorphenadrine, and it has been dubbed NMOA. Orphenadrine is a tertiary amine, and the chemical literature has shown that it is possible to nitrosate a tertiary amine directly, but that nitrosation conditions have to be more aggressive than for secondary amines. The risk of direct nitrosation of tertiary amines is being posited by some regulators. However, orphenadrine is also known to contain impurity C, the corresponding secondary amine. Did one, the other, or both of these potential precursors generate the complex nitrosamine? I don't think this is yet known, but some regulators are starting to ask that question. Another mechanism by which the presence of complex NDSRI impurities could be forming in tertiary amine drugs is that dealkylation of the API in the drug product is occurring at a trace level by an independent pathway, and the secondary amine degradant of the API is then subsequently nitrosated in the drug product. We, the industry and FDA alike, have to be concerned about knowing the real significance or insignificance of tertiary amines to nitrosamine formation risk in drug products, because about 35% of APIs are tertiary amines. This is the third area that would be of great benefit to investigate through GDSR funded research. To sum up the points I've presented today, GDSR funds would be well allocated towards First, developing cost and time efficient methods towards AI determination for data poor complex nitrosamines that are a valid alternative to the precautionary principle governed standard read across approach. Second, understanding the microspatial distribution and mobility of nitrosating species in excipients and amine precursors when they are impurities in APIs to better predict the formation kinetics of simple and complex nitrosamines in drug products. And finally, establishing whether tertiary and actually quaternary amines as well are nitrosatable in drug products to any meaningful extent, or if it is predominantly their trace secondary amine impurities that are being nitrosated. I hope you have found these points useful to consider, and I look forward to the panel discussion to follow. Thank you for your attention.